everybody uh, good good morning good evening or good afternoon depending on where you are thanks for tuning in from the various time zones welcome to this book launch co-organized by the center for comparative and public law of the university of hong kong and birmingham law school i'm cora chan associate professor of law from um, the university of hong kong i'm pleased to be co-chairing this event with professor fiona de Londres of birmingham law school this event marks the publication of China's national security endangering Hong Kong's rule of law by heart earlier this year. The idea of uh, this project first came up in 2013 when Fiona suggested that maybe we should do something to prepare Hong Kong for the introduction of national security legislation. And obviously at, at, the, at that time, we were think the scenario that we had in mind was the scenario of, of the Hong Kong government uh, um, attempting to reintroduce um, Article 23 legislation. But we were aware that um, China's national security initiatives could come um, in other forms. The project finally took shape in 2016 and 2017 when we held a series of workshops at Hong Kong U. Um, and the final product, um, the, the final product is the book. And uh, this book poses a single question it asks whether it is possible to protect China's conception of national security without endangering Hong Kong's rule of law, and provides a tentative answer by presenting some sources of resilience in Hong Kong's legal system for maintaining the rule of law. Uh, as many of you might be aware, this book was published shortly before China enacted the national security law for Hong Kong. And um, at the time of producing the book, when, when authors were, were, were writing their contributions, we, we had no idea that China was going to introduce a national security law for Hong Kong, and certainly not in the form that uh, we, we eventually see. Um, so a main purpose of today's event is to evaluate to what extent are the rule of law safeguards identified in the book still valid in light of the new security regime. Uh, in other words, um, to what extent is the book outdated given um, the most recent developments? Uh, Margaret uh, and I um, had a discussion about the event earlier on and she suggested that if we, if we need a title for, for the event, uh, we might just add, add the word um, uh, law um, to the title of the book so that it becomes um, China's national security law, cold and endangering Hong Kong's rule of law, question mark. So uh, this would be the question, this and related um, questions uh, would be the focus of today's event. Uh, we're going to put the book in the context of recent developments, including notably the enactment of the Hong Kong national security law. We are indebted to many people for their support of the project, including the Dean of Hong Kong U Law, Professor Fu Hualing, former Dean Professor Michael Hall, and the successive directors of CCPL, Professors Puja Kapai and Kelly Loper, and of course the current director, Professor Ho Jin Yap, um, and their very able teams. We also wish to thank um, Professor Victor Ramrash of the University of Victor, who has been very supportive of the project from the start. Um, above all, Fiona and I are deeply, deeply grateful to all the authors of the book, who we will introduce in a minute. Um, to all the authors, thank you very much for your contribution, without which the project would simply not have been possible. It has been a real delight and honor to work with you all. Um, we are also grateful for the support of the British Academy Luther Hume Small Grants Program and the work of the editorial team at heart. Finally, I would like to thank my co-editor, Fiona, for her wonderful leadership ideas and hard work, uh, which have made the journey of putting together the book and living. Before I hand over to Fiona, a quick word about the logistics for today's event. There will be two sessions, each with um, two or three presenters. Um, in each session, after the speakers present, there will be an open exchange um, amongst the authors. So there will be dedicated time for the panelists to ask questions and raise comments. After that, there will be a Q&A with the audience. Um, so for members of the audience who would like to ask questions, please type your questions in the Q&A box. 
um, and you may do this at any time during the event. Um, if you would like to direct your question at particular panelists, please state so uh, in, your, in, in your message in, in the, in the, in the Q&A box. Fiona and I will group the questions and direct as many as possible to the speakers during the Q&A. Um, so uh, welcome and thank you uh, once again um, for your support. Um, uh, over to you, Fiona. Thank you, Koran. Please allow me to add my welcome to all of you joining us from all over the world at different times. You'll see from our screens, we have people very early in the morning, very late at night, uh, joining us from um, the United States, the UK, Australia, um, all over the place. So we're, we're really pleased to have everybody here together and to be able to join together, as Cora said, to discuss what has happened since the manuscript for this book was submitted in the summer of 2019 and its publication earlier this year. Um, I want to add my thanks to those of Cora, to the Centre, to Heart Publishing, to the British Academy and to Birmingham Law School, as well as, of course, our exceptional authors, many of whom you will have the opportunity to hear from today. So let me very briefly introduce our authors. Uh, joining us this morning, we have a wonderful panel of colleagues. Um, we hope to be joined by Professor Victor Ramraj a little bit later in this session. I think he's having some technical problems, but in any case, we already have with us Dr. Paolo Cardinal from the University of Macau, Professor Carol Peterson from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, joining us, in fact, from uh, Michigan at present, Professor Lin Feng, the City University of Hong Kong, Dr. P. Yin Lo, a barrister at law in Hong Kong, Professor Simon Young from the University of Hong Kong as well. And we're delighted to be joined by some of those who contributed chapters to the book and will engage in the discussion, but who won't be giving substantive presentations. We just mention and welcome Professor Johannes Chan uh, from the University of Hong Kong, Professor Albert Chen, also from the University of Hong Kong, uh, Professor Sarabi Chopra from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Professor Fu Huai Ling from the University of Hong Kong, Professor Jill Cottrell Guy from the Katiba Institute in Nairobi, Professor Yash Guy also from the Katiba Institute, Mr. Danny Gittings from Hong Kong U, Dr. Lam Wai Man from the Open University of Hong Kong, and Dr. Margaret Ng, Barrister uh, in Hong Kong. So, uh, as Cora said, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentations and the author discussion. Please uh, do put those questions in the Q&A box throughout the session. We will be monitoring it and, and able to put our questions. So without further ado, allow me please to hand over to Professor Carol Peterson, who's going to uh, reflect on her chapter um, and uh, its relevance and um, uh, its uh, implications at the current time. Carol. Thank you very much. And I would like to echo my thanks. I won't list everyone that I'd like to thank in the interest of time. Uh, but I would like to echo my thanks to everyone who's been involved in producing the book and especially to our co two co-editors for not only steering the project, but bringing us all together at a time when it's really nice to get together and see colleagues again when we're also separated. Um, so, if Winnie could start with my first slide. Thank you. So, I've limited myself to seven slides, and the first slide really just summarizes what I'd like to talk about today. Um, I'm focusing on three main points in my chapter. First, that international law does matter. China has continuing obligations under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, and in my view, if it were properly implemented, it could provide a form of internal self-determination for Hong Kong. And the second part of the presentation, will talk about the relationship between the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which applies to Hong Kong, and national security law. Um, national security is not just a big, broad exception to the ICCPR. The restrictions that are imposed must be necessary and clearly defined if we are to satisfy the ICCPR. 
And then thirdly, I'll speak very briefly about the responses by international organizations like the UN, UN human rights experts, and foreign governments thus far. And I would like to just demonstrate that these governments do have every right to monitor China's compliance with the joint declaration to determine whether Hong Kong is still functioning as a separate legal system for the purposes of international agreements like extradition agreements. Um, however, if I have time, I'll explain briefly why I do not support some of the sanctions from the Trump administration, because I think they're unduly punitive and perhaps counterproductive. So if we could move to slide two, please. So as I've explained in the first part of my chapter, um, Hong Kong was on the UN's list of non-self-governing territories until 1972, and as early as 1960, the right to self-determination for a colonized people was a crystallized norm of customary international law. That was recognized by the ICJ in its Chagos advisory opinion. And yet, Hong Kong was removed from the UN's list in 1972 without public consultation. Why? Because the PRC successfully asserted its competing territorial com claims over the land, and it had a particularly strong claim over the new territories. That doesn't mean, though, that China got the right to rule Hong Kong any way it wants, because it voluntarily agreed to limit its authority and its exercise of authority over Hong Kong in a binding international treaty. And in my view, if that treaty is properly implemented, it's a, a fair way to reconcile the PRC's territorial claims with the normal rights of a colonized people under international law. And autonomy arrangements have been used in other situations of disputed um, colonial territories. And I've cited a book that discusses this and refers to autonomy in those situations as a form of internal self-determination. I've also discussed this in an article last year in the Hong Kong Law Journal if people are interested in exploring it further. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the autonomy arrangement in the joint declaration is that although it, ha although it has certain flaws, particularly the vague promises on democratic reforms, in other respects, it actually promises a, an extraordinarily high degree of autonomy. And when it was first adopted and ratified as a binding treaty, many commentators talked about what an extraordinary uh, degree of autonomy was promised, particularly the concept of international legal personality, which Rhoda Mushkat has discussed in her book. Um, Hong Kong, in many ways, does act like an independent state. It can enter into agreements with foreign countries. It has its own currency, its own monetary system. And one of the most important promises, a concession really, that China made was that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights would continue to be enforced in Hong Kong, even though China itself has not ratified the treaty. And that is why the UN Human Rights Committee continues to review Hong Kong as a territorial unit. That treaty was registered with the UN, and China certainly benefited from making these extensive promises. It it achieved a peaceful transition with a very intact economy. Now, of course, it's very fashionable among some scholars to claim that the joint declaration no longer has any practical significance and that one country, two systems is really some sort of unilateral gift from the Chinese government to Hong Kong, a purely internal affair. But that is not the way the international community sees it. China may have the raw power to remove one country, two systems, but if it does so, it will be violating its international obligations. Next slide, please. Now, in the next slide, I summarize some of the potential conflicts between national security laws and the ICCPR. When we listen to radio debates sometimes by certain Hong Kong politicians, I frequently hear politicians say, oh, well, the ICCPR allows restrictions for national security, but that's not true. The ICCPR doesn't create some big, broad exception for national security law. Rather, it allows restrictions to certain rights, but only if provided by law, which means the restrictions must be defined with reasonable certainty, and they must be truly necessary for national security. Now, when I drafted my chapter, of course, I was, as Cora said, hoping that any law to implement Article 23 of the basic law would be drafted locally. And so I cited a number of decisions by the UN Human Rights Committee, some judgments by the 
uh, European Court of Human Rights, also General Comment 34 from the Human Rights Committee, which I hoped would help guide the drafters if local legislation was drafted. Unfortunately, we have this national security law now instead, which was drafted, frankly, in a bit of a haste, and it was not drafted by people who are familiar with implementing the ICCPR because it doesn't apply. And I think we see the result with this purple flag waving about. I'm not sure if you can all read it, but it's basically a catch-all. You may be violating the national security law. Maybe you're having practicing secession. Maybe it's subversive. I mean, the police don't even seem to feel the need to be specific about what they're threatening to arrest people for. Um, and it shows the real problems with this national security law and the conflicts with the ICCPR. Next slide, please. So um, in an article that I've just published just a few weeks ago, I think it came out in the Hong Kong Law Journal, I summarize a lot of other problems that I see with the na new national security law. In addition to these really broadly defined and often vaguely defined new offenses, in my view, the biggest threat are the new security institutions. And in particular, the Committee for Safeguarding National Security, the new National Security Advisor, which represents Beijing, and the Office for Safeguarding National Security, which means that mainland security personnel are now operating openly in Hong Kong, not just clandestinely, but openly. And it appears that so long as they're acting in the course of their duties, they are not subject to judicial review by the Hong Kong courts. And that is very worrying. And that is why I titled my article, The Disappearing Firewall. I fear that the separation between the two criminal justice systems has been greatly weakened. It's impossible to know how far it's been weakened because we don't know how much the law will be enforced. Uh, but when we look, for example, at Article 55, we see that although 2 million people marched last year against extradition to mainland China, now a person can apparently be extradited to China without any extradition hearing at all. It's not even really extradition. Jurisdiction is simply assumed by the mainland government. We're told that this will be very rare, uh, but when you look at the actual language of Article 55, it's pretty vague, and the procedure is remarkably simple. Basically, the chief executive just has to make a request, which of course she will do. We know if she's asked to make the request and the mainland government can take over jurisdiction of the case. That's pretty scary given the gravity of being transferred to mainland China for trial. I'm not gonna speak about the extraordinary police powers because I believe Simon will be speaking about that, but they are pretty scary. Um, and I think due to shortness of time, I will not speak too much about the extraterritorial reach of the law other than to note that it's even more extensive than the People's PRC's criminal law because it doesn't have a double criminality requirement. So you may be prosecuted if you come back to Hong Kong for doing something in a foreign country that was perfectly legal there. Now, is there any good news? Uh, well, the good news is Article 4 of the National Security Law does say that the ICCPR and other human rights provisions of the basic law should continue to apply. And I do believe that Hong Kong judges will try to interpret vague language so as to comply with the ICCPR. Um, we've already seen some evidence of this in the first case. However, judges have to know in the back of their minds that the overriding power of interpretation rests with the NPC Standing Committee. And just with Article 158 of the basic law, we have seen much more assertive use of that power. So I'm very concerned by that. And I think we also have to recognize that the police and the prosecutors may not be interpreting the law with the same goal of complying with the ICCPR. And thus they may take steps, arrest, charging, prosecuting, that curtail and chill ICCPR protected rights long before they can be litigated in the Hong Kong courts. So it's all very worrying in my opinion. Next slide, please. So I turn in the last uh, two slides to consider what can international organizations, international human rights experts do to try to monitor um, and to try to remind Beijing of its obligations under the joint declaration. And I'm not gonna read these quotes at length, but the reason I put them um, on the screen 
is they are very good examples, very recent, but not uncommon examples of how Beijing is trying very hard to intimidate, I think, UN human rights experts from commenting on its human rights record. So in June 2020, we see this very strong criticism simply because the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights reminded Beijing that any new law for Hong Kong must comply with the ICCPR. PRC claimed that she was grossly interfering in China's sovereignty and violating the purposes and principles of the charters of, Charter of the UN. No, she's not. That's her mandate. That's what she's supposed to do, is to comment on situations in which governments may not be respecting and protecting human rights. This month, seven UN human rights experts, people with mandates from the Human Rights Council, wrote a very detailed letter, very careful consideration of the national security law, and Beijing shot back, saying they had grossly interfered with China's internal affairs and violated the code of conduct of the special procedures of the UN Human Rights Council. I really don't see how. What's important to notice is that Beijing is not simply disagreeing with the substance of their views, it's attacking their right to comment. And this is part of a trend, and I do fear that if it continues, China could really undermine the entire UN human rights system. The situation to watch is the Human Rights Committee because it has now issued the list of issues for its upcoming review of Hong Kong under the ICCPR. It has requested a good deal of additional information about the new national security law. And in the past, the Hong Kong government has been pretty good about responding to these list of issues, this request for additional information. I wonder whether it will be the same now that we have these national security personnel operating in Hong Kong and advising um, so overtly, really, the chief executive. I also wonder whether Hong Kong NGOs will still be able to participate in the way they have. They've always been very active by writing shadow reports, traveling to Geneva for the review, and I wonder if they will feel nervous about doing that. I don't know. I'm getting a little short on time, so I won't say anything about the General Assembly, but it does have the power to seek an advisory opinion from the ICJ on whether the joint declaration has been violated, although I think it's quite unlikely given China's geopolitical influence now. Um, and then to my final slide, please. So finally, I consider some of the unilateral responses and some sanctions that have been adopted by governments. Um, Clearly, the United Kingdom has a right and a duty to monitor compliance with the joint declaration, uh, despite what Beijing likes to say. Um, I'm pleased to say, see that the British government has become somewhat more assertive and willing to call out clear violations of the joint declaration, and also that it is you know, developing a scheme by which BNO passport holders can actually move in, to the UK if they feel the need to do so. Um, it's important to realize, though, that it's not just the United Kingdom that has an interest in this matter. Foreign governments that have international agreements with Hong Kong, because it's been exercising this degree of international legal personality, have a responsibility to review those agreements and consider whether they think the Hong Kong government is still in a position to uphold its end of these bargains. Extradition agreements are very clear examples. A number of countries have terminated or suspended their extradition agreements with Hong Kong. Why? Because they don't extradite fugitives to mainland China. And now because of the national security personnel and the effects of Article 55, they, they're not sure if they can be confident that someone wouldn't be re-extradited to a place where they may not get a fair trial. We're also seeing new export restrictions of sensitive technology, materials that might be used to repress protesters. Governments don't feel comfortable exporting that kind of material to Hong Kong anymore. Um, and frankly, a number of governments are being asked questions by their citizens who live and work in Hong Kong. I mean, they're a little concerned um, about the enforcement processes, and so they're really monitoring the enforcement. Um, I won't mention media organizations or corporations right now because I, I do realize I've gone a little over time. Uh, the last thing I want to say, though, is I have real qualms about some of the measures that the Trump administration has adopted. I don't think President Trump is particularly concerned about Hong Kong as much as he is concerned about his own political advantage. And I think some of the sanctions are just unnecessarily punitive, such as the insistence that goods exported from Hong Kong should now be labeled made in China. 
I don't see the point of that. I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it helps to promote or protect Hong Kong's autonomy. It may actually just push Hong Kong to integrate more quickly with the mainland's economy. And yet we do know some Hong Kong activists have openly asked for this kind of sanction. And I'm just not sure it was a good strategy. But in conclusion, I have to say I, that every time I see a Hong Kong or PRC official stamp their fists and yell that how angry they are that some country is not treating Hong Kong like a separate legal system anymore, I think, well, that's you kind of reap what you sow. I mean, if you're going to insist, as we hear again and again, that Hong Kong is just an internal affair, you really cannot expect Hong Kong to continue to be treated as a separate common law jurisdiction. Beijing really can't have it both ways. If it wants Hong Kong to have this, the benefits of a high degree of autonomy, such as separate membership in the WTO and a separate customs territory, they have to really show that Hong Kong has enough autonomy to run its legal system as a separate jurisdiction. So thank you very much. And I appreciate your attention and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, a really interesting presentation there, not least of the technique of trying to um, project a recategorization of the relationship between China and Hong Kong as an internal matter rather than a matter of international legal concern. Let me turn now to Paolo Cardinal uh, for his uh, remarks. Up to 10 minutes, Paolo. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for this wonderful event, uh, building upon the wonderful book that was extremely important, necessary and even more so considering the events that followed up after the publication of the book. And I will start by reminding something that I wrote in the opening of my essay regarding the future of one country, two systems. And I wrote at the time that when many see this formula as being at risk of being abandoned or at least strongly adulterated, there is for some a feeling of the second system being under siege. In this context, and bearing in mind that much can happen, and often very quickly, so that any predictions are probably unwise. Unfortunately, one must say that reality really surpassed this cautionary sentence. The evolution, or better say, the involution of the situation in Hong Kong enter a sort of warp velocity on one hand, and on the other hand, it brought seismic repercussions that are still reverberating throughout the juridical, judicial, social fabric of the special administrative region in Hong Kong. In fact, the self-entitled law of the PRC of China on safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong SAR became no less than an earthquake shaking strongly long established foundations. I would expect to see, and I still want to see, more discussions, especially academic, on this piece of legislation. Usually, we are witnessing people say, what is this, uh, the purpose of this uh, legislation, why the crimes are established in this so vague way, etc., etc. I would like to propose something a bit before, a step before. Uh, it is important for me to to analyze this in a constitutionality aspect, in a constitutionality approach. That is to say, is this national security law constitutional and constitutional in face of what? In face of the basic law, why? Because we could ask if there is a case of formal inconstitutionality in the sense that the form that was adopted to approve this law, if it's that law or should be other form specifically a law from the LEGCO. Also in terms of a material of, or substantial approach in terms of analyzing if the contexts of the national security law or some of the contexts are in accordance with the top of the pyramid in the sources of law in uh, Hong Kong, that is the basic law in terms of substance, which some articles, some norms may be 
facing the test of constitutionality and maybe failing the test of constitutionality when compared with basic law, the joint declaration and so on. Also, another possible approach is what we call an organic constitutional test in the sense to understand if the body, the political body that approved the piece of legislation, it's the one that should be having that power or if it, that power was usurped, taken away from other body. We could also even add a fourth approach, a teleological approach in the sense that the goals of this new legislation are really the goals that are announced, are really the goals that are supposed to, to be met or the goals are something different. Besides this idea of constitutionality or lack of it, of the new security uh, law, it was important, it would be important also to address issues of legitimacy and adequacy. Legitimacy in the sense, for example, and I'm not talking now about constitutionality, but legitimacy in the sense the population was consulted in this very important law or not, it was not. Why the law was published and entered into force within a few hours? Why the law was published only originally in one of the official languages and it took several days to be published in the other official language? What are we talking about? Are we talking about now about rule of law or rule by law or even something else, rule of whim? What is going on with this situation? Also in terms of legitimacy, I've read, I've heard again and again that this law would only apply to very small uh, cases, to, to very little um, situ situations that are very little, very small. Well. It's not true. First of all, when I hear something like this in criminal law, well, all the criminal law are supposed to apply only to a very minority of situations. Homicide, rape, uh, corruption, etc. You don't believe that the whole population are murderers and so on. So this is something that is given. Besides, when this kind of legislation shows up and people are, the officials are insisting that this is only for a small number of people, etc., etc. This reminds me of other laws in historical processes like Nuremberg laws, for example. Besides that, there is a situation that, of course, due to the law, it's not just to few people. You have rules that apply to all schools not just a few number of schools. You have rules that apply to all universities. You have rules that apply to all journalists and so on and so on. Finally, the, the other point is the point of adequacy. Is this law with its solutions, with its mechanisms adequate to the common law that is enforced in Hong Kong? Or, of course we heard, of course it is, it is. Or we can say, if I can have this image, well, you are going to keep playing football, but this time with a rugby ball, in the sense that apparently it's the same, but it's not, of course, because you have mechanisms and you have definitions that are so vague that it will be very difficult to make this law adequate in the contest, the general contest of the common law of Hong Kong. Regarding this, and as predicted, uh, after the situation in Hong Kong, in Macau, even though we have already a national security law approved a decade ago and without any problems, without any situations, of course, we start to hear that now Macau has to have a new law or has to have a new uh, revision or adding new pieces of legislation, namely criminal and most worrisome criminal procedure, because many of these uh, problems will arise not just from the criminal law aspects but mostly from the criminal procedure aspects such as the right of defense, the right to have a lawyer, the right to be heard, etc, etc, etc. So bearing this in mind, and I mentioned this also in my paper, are we facing, are we witnessing a move towards what we call a police state? Not a police state in terms of classical history of law, like the Prussian state, but a sort of modern police state. Unfortunately, after this national security law in Hong Kong and the evolution that we are having and witnessing in Hong Kong and in Macau, we are clearly moving towards what we can say a new kind of 
police state, a certain kind of a reincarnation of police state. Also, it is uh, of relevance to see that there is a sort of eagerness becoming more and more apparent in Hong Kong as in Macau, an eagerness of officials to please, to, to really excuse and justify everything, even when things are not justified in terms of law. And we, as lawyers, we have to seek justifications in terms that are legal, not justifications that are merely political or illegal. And uh, one more point in, relevant in this uh, context is the new soapbox opera regarding the separation of powers, the saga of separation of powers. Uh, this is uh, a sort of almost ridiculous uh, discussion. It is obvious that both Macau and Hong Kong enjoy a system of separation of powers. There are three branches, each of the branches have their own competences, there are mechanisms of checks and balances, but then suddenly someone decided to established that there is no separation of powers. And then we see some kind of circus uh, activities from some officials trying to say, yes, we don't have, but however, the courts, I mean, what is the ultimate goal of this? Uh, the basic law immediately in Article 2, but before the basic law, joint declaration clearly established this. Are we going to also assassinate the separation of powers? what will be the meaning of that, just a subservient, obedient legislative assembly, or more than that, courts are also supposed to engage in this altogether buzz riding together in terms of uh, cooperating and being obey obeying the master, and we will have this kind of situation that clearly undermines the autonomy, the constitutionality, the rule of law of both Macau and Hong Kong. I would not bother you giving examples on how the distribution of powers and competences, how this separation works and works internally in terms of the political system of Macau and Hong Kong, but also there is a certain way of distribution of powers and separations between the regional SAR and the sovereign. And I can just mention articles 23, 22, 16, 14, 2, 104, 106, etc., 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 plus some articles in which there is a sort of cooperation between regional bodies and sovereign bodies, such as the ones in article 17, 19, number 3, and 18. Uh, because of constraints of time, I will not deal with it, but you know what I'm talking about. And then let's check, of course, Article 23, one must stress, is one of the pinnacles of the special administrative region's autonomy. It is one of the safeguards of autonomy. And this constitutional norm does not allow space to be simply put aside and made such just inapplicable or suspended. It says in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong SAR shall enact laws on its own. And then it goes on. It's the Hong Kong SAR that shall enact laws regarding this national security. You can say, well, this would be would mean tying Beijing's ends totally. Yes and no. Yes, it was something that was decided. No one imposed Article 23 on Beijing, but on the other hand, there are some measures of safeguards. And in real exceptional situations, Beijing could always resort to Article 18, number four, and apply a law from Beijing to Hong Kong in a, a case of uh, a state of exception, or it could try to simply change the basic law, change Article 23. Of course, there will be then a problem of knowing if that would be in accordance with the joint declaration or not, but this is to just to point something. The competence is rested, was is attributed to the SARs. First point, you cannot just simply forget it and then be done with it. There are some safeguard mechanisms that work, they are exceptional, precisely because they are, should only operate in exceptional circumstances. And like I said, Article 18, number four, and the provision for the revision of the basic law. In this, I remember a movie I watched a long time ago, 
the call of the Rockies. And there is something that is really, that really impressed me that time and I apply here. At, at a given time, someone says, the operation was a success, but the patient died. So this is something that reminds me, okay, yes, we did well, we do, it's, everything is very good, but okay, the patient died. Now, I have very few times, I would like to say something. In Macau, we have two important decisions from the Court of Final Appeal denying the freedom of demonstration. One related to a demonstration that intended to show solidarity with Hong Kong demonstrators and to claim, to, to ask for not to have police abuse, that was denied. Among other things saying that would be an interference with uh, Hong Kong affairs, which is ridiculous. And for one of the very few times there was a vote of dissent. Another one related to Tiananmen also denied and also again with one vote of dissent in three to one to one, which is extremely rare in the CFA. Also, we had some uh, interview by the president of the CFA, some of to China Daily, saying that the role of its court is to promote stability and not to allow stability in Macau, in Hong Kong, in the mainland to be uh, disturbed. So the role is not to apply the law, to render justice, but to promote stability, like it was just a normal government department. There are several other things that I would like to talk about, but just one very little thing. Carl Schmitt. Uh, it is for me something that I really don't understand how come in the later years Carl Schmitt, if you, for those of you who don't know, a German brilliant scholar, constitutional lawyer and political scientist, but someone that really provide the foundations of Nazi regime, the foundations of totalitarianism. And why is this Carl Schmitt being totally uh, received by recent scholars in mainland and it's like the main important uh, it's besides Karl Marx is the author that is most quoted by the president of China non-Chinese which is something of relevance and of course we have the Führer principle the leader protects the law and so on and so on and so on this to to finalize oh, the system is being shaken, the trust is being eroded, people are more and more believing that um, something is not going well, something is not going in accordance with, with what was promised by the Joint Declaration and the, the Basic Law. With the new, the, new the, the new securities law, we can say that from laws empire that was enforced in Hong Kong, the laws empire, we moved to the law of the empire. And to end in an optimistic note, and since Germans, German authors are now very uh, popular in mainland China, I would want to bring here Thomas Mann in his 1938 book, 1938, The Coming Victory of Democracy. That's the title of this book, and it says, he called democracy timelessly human and fascism, its opponent, a transitory manifestation. So, let's believe that this democracy is really what is timelessly human. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Paolo, for that piece. I think raising so many questions around the uh, machinations of exceptionality, the contagion effects across the broader system of exceptional laws, and of course their impact on principles of justification and legitimacy uh, in, within legal systems. I'm delighted now to be able to turn to Professor Victor Ramraj, who's going to give us some reflections um, on the book as a whole, um, and uh, speaking from his um, unparalleled expertise in comparative uh, laws on emergency and counterterrorism. Victor. Thank you, uh, Fiona. C can you hear me okay? Okay. Good. Uh, so uh, greetings everyone from uh, Victoria, Canada and from uh, Coast Salish territory. And let me take a moment uh, as we do in Victoria to acknowledge with respect the uh, Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory my university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples whose historical ties to the land continue to this day. 
Uh, I am honored and grateful uh, for this opportunity to speak to you today on this topic of such gravity for the people of uh, Hong Kong. And I do apologize for my slight delay in, in joining the session. I, I heard uh, some of uh, my, my colleagues on the panel, but uh, I, I didn't catch uh, all of uh, Carol Peterson's comments, so my apologies for that. Um, before I get to the substance uh, of my talk, though, let me take a moment to uh, heartily congratulate uh, Cora and Fiona and all of the contributors on this magnificent and supremely important collection of essays. Uh, I appreciate that for many uh, in the audience, and perhaps some of the authors as well, it might seem that this book has been eclipsed by recent events, not least the passage of uh, mainland China's national security law for Hong Kong. Uh, however, uh, having read the book from cover to cover, um, at least virtually, uh, and against uh, the backdrop of these developments, I sense that this book very much points the way forward. So as uh, Fiona alluded to, I come to this topic as a comparative constitutional law scholar with a particular interest in emergency powers, as well as transnational law and legal pluralism in Asia. Uh, having spent 16 years of my career in Singapore uh, with shorter stints in Japan and Tha uh, Thailand and Northern Ireland and London. Uh, I also come to this book as someone profoundly concerned about the state of world affairs. The zeitgeist of our era and the large scale legal and political challenges it poses are concerning. Uh, and among the trends of particular concern are uh, four, uh, the increased polarized, polarized nature of politics, the lack of public trust in institutions, uh, as we can see in mass protests on climate policy and pipelines, Black Lives Matter and systemic racism, and political reform from Bangkok to Minsk. The lack of responsiveness on the part of governments across a range of political regimes, from more democratic regimes to more authoritarian regimes. And finally, uh, a growing intolerance of legal pluralism and diversity in political institutions from the post-Brexit United Kingdom to India's crackdown in Kashmir. As a Canadian, I also approach today's topic mindful of my own country's shameful human rights record uh, with its indigenous peoples, which is often pointed out by the Chinese media. For those of you who are not aware, Canada is struggling to come to terms with centuries of unequal treaties, discrimination, and decades of uh, a terrible policy of removing Indigenous children from their families into residential schools. Uh, fortunately, this policy is now discontinued, but it's been described in infamously as intended to, quote, kill the Indian in the child a policy now recognized as a form of genocide. Now, despite this bleak history uh, in Canada, there are glimmers of hope, which I will return to later in this talk. But for now, back, back to the subject at hand and, and the book. So it's impossible for me to do justice to every chapter in the book in the 12 or so minutes I have left. So let me focus on two points that emerge out of my reading of it. First, I want to suggest why Article 23 legislation might still be worth pursuing. And second, I want to explore why even if it is not successful, there may be some hope, however faint, for one country, two systems, and for Hong Kong as a distinct legal order uh, and society within China. So first, why might Article 23 legislation still be worth pursuing? This book clearly outlines the immense difficulties for Hong Kong, even before the new national security law in relation to Article 23 legislation. It traces the complexity of the legal, 
political, economic, and geopolitical environment from 2003 through the Belt and Road Initiative to the 19, uh, 20, sorry, 2019 protests against the extradition bill. With China's new national security law now in place, it might seem futile, bordering on absurd, to return to the Article 23 process, despite the direction in the new uh, Chinese law to do so. However, in some respects, it might be worth pursuing Article 23 legislation. And this book, I suggest, points the way forward. Now, I appreciate that the suggestion might be met with a great deal of derision, and I'm on shaky ground here. But paradoxically, China's new national security law might open up some space to get the law right from the perspective of Hong Kong's legal order and from a one country, two systems perspective. My suggestion is that with the overwhelming pressure of China's national security imperative now off, there's an opening to draft model legislation. What might that legislation look like? The chapters in this book paint point the way forward, and all of the chapters have something to contribute to the legislative pro project. But let me make three observations. First, Simon Young's chapter uh, presents an obvious and principled starting point for getting the content right in terms of the specific offenses, their definition and scope, and their legal consequences. And along with Simon's chapter, other chapters help to identify the particular sticky sticking points, including the status of peaceful advocacy. Second, Carol Peterson's chapter shows how the ICCPR and international human rights generally might inform, supplement, and enhance the core content of the law. And third, many of the chapters, uh, the other chapters, show uh, the importance of inst the institutions that would implement an Article 23 law. A new uh, drafting process might also be an opportunity to get the consultation and drafting procedures right, with the goal of uh, both of including as broad a coalition as might be possible in the, in the deliberations and injecting some of Hong Kong's legal traditions and values back into the increasingly messy legal landscape. I anticipate that many of you would have fervent objections to the suggestion. So let me suggest three obje potential objections that spring to mind. First, I anticipate that some, uh, my co-panelist, uh, Carol Peterson perhaps, might say that the firewall has already been breached uh, or the one country, two systems ship has already sailed, uh, whichever metaphor you prefer. Second, I suspect some, possibly Danny Gittings, might see a new Article 23 law as some combination of utopian and pointless in the face of the mainland's new national security law. I'm inferring from my reading of his chapter. And I imagine yet others would object that returning to Article 23 now would be conceding too much. That, uh, and would therefore be a political non-starter in an increasingly divided society. I feel the force of these objections, and I'm sure there would be many more, not least that even model legislation, even if model legislation could be drafted according to a model process, there is no guarantee it would ever be enacted by LegCo. Which brings me to a second suggestion, that even if model Article 23 legislation was not ultimately enacted, it might still generate some faint longer term hope for one country, two systems. Now, let me begin the second point with a clarification. A new Article 23 process could have one of two goals. The first obvious goal would be 
to draft a law that could be enacted by the LegCo. Uh, this has obvious problems, legal and political, which have been thoroughly canvassed by the contributors. However, a second goal might be to draft a model law along the lines of the ALI, the American Legal Institute's model penal code in the United States, or UNCITRAL's model law on international commercial arbitration, model laws that have considerable influence and persuasive power, even though they are not legally binding. There's much more to say about model laws, but I limit myself to three points. First, model laws can be normatively powerful. They provide a means by which alternative realities can be imagined in a systematic way. Formal laws and cases can be evaluated and critiqued. And legal reforms can be proposed and negotiated. A model law also allows for alternative proposals on contentious points to be flagged within an overall legislative scheme. Second, a model law keeps the one country, two systems formula alive and the powerful ideas, uh, sorry, the powerful ideals that drive it, ideals of legal pluralism and harmonious coexistence which themselves have deep roots in the region's cultures and traditions. I would add that for many outside Hong Kong, the ideals of legal pluralism and coexistence are sorely in need of a principled defense. I have in mind places like Kashmir in India or the Rakhine state in Myanmar. Finally, even when things look bleak for one country to systems or for harmonious coexistence, there is still some value in taking the long view, though it may be uh, nothing more than cold comfort for many. I am not, of course, as uh, invested as you in Hong Kong are, and it is easy for me to speak about these issues from across the Pacific and to suggest taking the long view. Um, even if I contemplate the long arm of China's national security law. I acknowledge that taking the long view is a luxury that may not sit well for those for whom China's new law is their lived experience and a harsh new reality. So let me return as promised to Canada and its shameful treatment of its indigenous peoples. Last year, my law school at the University of Victoria launched the world's first JD, JID, double degree program. That's JD, doc, uh, Juris Doctor, and JID, uh, Doctor of Indigenous Law degree, to train each year some 20 students in both common law and indigenous law. Now, this program is not a panacea. But it is, I suggest, a sign of hope. My indigenous colleagues and students and their parents and ancestors have struggled over the centuries to keep their own legal traditions, but also their languages, cultures, songs, worldviews, and ties to the land alive in the face of over overwhelming pressures of assimilation. Now, with the double degree, they have an opening to reshape Canada's legal system in a way that embraces one country and three legal traditions, three if we include the civil law tradition in Quebec. Legal traditions are embedded in society and their preser preservation requires not just an attentiveness to legal norms and codes, and as I suggest, a, a model law, but also an attentiveness to the social fabric of the society that sustains them. As I wrap up, let me end by paraphrasing Paulo Cardinal's uh, words from page 100 of the book. He says, we should look for sources of resilience beyond the constitutional texts, and in the quote, institutions, 
traditions, culture, civil society, and media attention. In other words, and I'm paraphrasing him now, in the living local context in which the law thrives. Thank you for your kind invitation to speak at this event and congratulations again to the editors, to uh, Fiona and Cora and the contributors on this remarkable book, which I am very pleased to report is already available in the University of Victoria's Law Library. Thank you and I, I look forward very much to our discussion. Thank you so much, Victor, for your generous remarks and your thoughtful and provocative uh, paper, which I think and hope will generate plenty of discussion. And so we move on now to the discussion phase. I want to uh, start by offering an opportunity to the um, other contributors to the book to react to, discuss or pose questions to those who have already spoken. And I also have some questions from the audience uh, in the Q&A box, which I'm going to pose uh, to the authors as well. So may I ask first whether any of our colleagues who contributed to this collection uh, would like to react to any of the three presentations uh, we've been so fortunate to hear? I think we have to thank Victor for raising the uh, possibility of um, uh, local legislation for Article 23, even if I don't uh, necessarily, I'm not sure I call it utopian, but uh, necessarily uh, agree with his approach. I mean, living on the ground in Hong Kong and having the national security, of course this book, started looking at the idea of local legislation and then the, the whole ground rules change with um, the national security law and we've been absolutely preoccupied over the last couple of months um, thinking about the implications of national security law itself but it is worth returning of course it's now a very different reality but returning to the issue of whether there is any room for local legislation and when Victor was talking just now I was inclined to dismiss it initially but then I was thinking I mean the national security law doesn't cover treason and sedition and we have seen actually in the last few weeks uh, the Hong Kong government extraordinarily using these very old sedition law we have on the books um, which is almost certainly much worse than anything you would propose for sedition these days. Now of course that may well be shot down in the courts on Bill of Rights grounds once it actually gets to the courts but uh, in this climate I don't think we can necessarily guarantee on that so I'm not, I'm still thinking this through, I'm not sure quite where we go, but it is time to uh, reevaluate uh, or think again in the current context um, about whether there is still any purpose to be served by local Article 23 legislation and uh, Victor plays a, a useful role in raising that. Thank you, Danny, I think that's right. And interestingly, those uh, in the audience and those present as panelists who were there in the first workshop that we had, we had two workshops on this, uh, many years ago would remember that we had a long conversation about whether a model law would in fact be something that it would be valuable to generate and it was met with uh, some caution but as Danny rightly says the terrain has changed very significantly uh, since then. Are there any other contributions from our colleagues before I go to the questions from the audience? Sarabi. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, Fiona, I had a, a question for Carol. Carol, thank you. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, one aspect of the, the way the ground has shifted since uh, late June this year is that um, international advocacy is much more fraught for um, civil, members of civil society, academics, NGOs located in Hong Kong. So in a sense, the burden of advocacy, I think, needs to be shouldered more heavily by those located elsewhere, even with the claimed extraterritorial jurisdiction. You know, there's a layer of insulation that comes from being outside of the PRC. Um, in light of that, um, given your criticism of some of the moves the US has made, what types of advocacy do you think would be useful internationally at this moment? Fiona, do you want me to answer questions now or do you want to wait? Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. You can. Okay. Um, first thing, I, I just do want to respond to the one thing that Victor said. I don't actually think one country, two systems is dead or that the ship is sailed, but I do feel that the legal firewall is damaged. And I think it's too soon to tell whether 
it can be repaired or whether the damage will become greater. A lot depends on whether the new security institutions exercise restraint um, and whether the Hong Kong courts are you know, given the space to exercise their interpretive powers. And I, I think we just can't tell yet. I was actually one of the people who suggested that Hong Kong academics and lawyers get together and draft a model law way, way back. Um, so I, I appreciate that suggestion. I, d I don't know if, if it's too late for that now. Um, Sarabi's question, um, I totally agree with you. And that's one reason I raised the question in my presentation about whether Hong Kong NGOs will be able to be as active in submitting shadow reports, traveling to Geneva. I think it's going to become a lot more um, dangerous for them to do so. Um, and I have absolutely no qualms about international organizations, foreign governments, international human rights experts criticizing China and calling it out when it violates the joint declaration. And I don't have a problem with sanctions when I feel that they're strategic and purposeful. Um, I do feel, I don't have any problems with governments that say we have to end our extradition agreement, for example, or suspend it because it's, it's just logical. It's not putative so much as it's a logical response. I do feel that some of the Trump administration's uh, sanctions are just more like the shotgun approach and that Donald Trump is more concerned with his own political career and advantage. I mean, he's going around essentially saying, oh, I fixed the Hong Kong problem because now goods will be labeled made in China. Well, what have you actually fixed? <laughs> I mean, you've lashed out. And, and um, it's, it's difficult for me to know because I'm not an economist, though I did major in economics as an undergraduate, but it's really difficult for me to predict what the impact is going to be. But I have read a number of articles that have raised the concern that if Hong Kong is punished too much by sanctions, then there is going to be a natural, a natural trend for Hong Kong to integrate even more quickly with the mainland's economy. Out of just because it has to to survive, and that may happen anyway with the Bay, Bay, the what is it, the Greater Bay Area Integration Plan. So it may happen anyway, but I just feel that some of the sanctions that have come out of my own government have not been really carefully thought out. With what is the purpose? What are we trying to achieve? And are we leaving some room for negotiation where maybe we have held something back, some sanction back that by not doing later, perhaps we might be able to get some concessions. Um, but of course, I realize I'm, it's all a little bit speculative. And I, I saw in the chat, there were quite a few questions about that. Um, I think that was all the, there was one other question that was in the chat. Maybe I'll just briefly answer it while I've got the mic. And Please, that is, yeah. uh, someone asked, well, why, I think what the question was, was you're concerned that police and prosecutors in these special divisions may not be as robust as the courts in interpreting the uh, vague language in the national security law to comply with the ICCPR, but does that really matter if eventually the courts can correct it? And the problem I see with that is that very often it takes a long time for, for a case to go to court. And in the meantime, you've suffered the violation of your rights. There's also been the chilling effect I mean, it just takes one person to disappear across the border pursuant to Article 55, and that's going to put terror in a lot of people's hearts. Um, and so I think the chilling effect cannot be underestimated. And we also have to remember that sometimes people don't have the legal funds or the wherewithal to keep appealing and fight battles. We've seen cases like that when the Hong Kong National Party was prohibited under the society's ordinance. I actually published an article saying that I thought the decision violated the ICCPR, um, but he eventually did not appeal his case because he only has so much money, right? And, and legal aid is not being provided so much for these cases. So I do think we have to worry not just about the cases that make it to court, and especially that make it to the higher courts, but about the cases that are being dealt with by the police and by prosecutors, and just about the chilling effect. So I think I've probably taken up too much time, and 
if there's any other questions I didn't answer, please feel free to raise them again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. And I hope that um, deals both the response on sanctions and the response on um, I, the ICCPR and police and prosecutors uh, is sufficient to deal with the questions raised. We've been lucky to have quite a lot of questions asked um, in, the, in the chat box, so uh, we won't be able to, to look at them all um, in the precise terms that the questioners uh, posed, but, but the uh, panelists are reading them and so shaping their answers um, accordingly. And just to add one point to Carol's answer on the police and prosecutors, um, I would say also it's it's both the point about people not always being able to pursue litigation, and I think a point about a rule of law mindset. You know, if if you comply with law just because the law might be enforced, then uh, you don't necessarily have a mindset that the law is by its nature an autonomously limiting instrument uh, and in this case that the uh, international covenant on civil and political rights operates in that way i think that that's uh, looking from the outside also something that would be of of concern so i have a number of other questions just to note that two questions one about the recent departure of a non-permanent judge uh, and one about legal mechanisms that the courts in hong kong might deploy uh, will be addressed in the second session rather than in this session uh, so I, I wanted to uh, pose a question now to, uh, I'll pick Paolo for it, there wasn't a specific panellist uh, who was asked, and it's um, from Gladys Lee who asks about uh, the possible effect um, on the citizens' ability to think for themselves, the freedom of conscience, belief and autonomy um, of the uh, censorship and control of information, pressures on academic institutions and cur curtailing of press access including citizen journalists. I wonder, Paolo, if you have a response to that, and I will leave space then for Carol and Victor if they would also like to come in on it. Um, I'm not particularly uh, special in this, in this, but as general, of course, uh, your freedom of thought, your freedom of demonstration, your ability to go to sources, freedom of the press, etc. They thrive in ambiences where you have democracy or proto-democracy, like in Hong Kong and Macau, it's characterized by proto-democracy. You have this uh, much better than when you have a totalitarian system. I'm not saying Hong Kong and Macau are totalitarian, but uh, I believe, unfortunately, that they are moving from proto-democracy to some kind of authoritarianism, with elements of authoritarianism imposed both by the sovereign and also with uh, the glad uh, uh, cooperation from local or regional bodies. So my answer is, of course, uh, if the general ambiency, the general system becomes the more and more authoritarian it becomes, the more difficult it will be for your freedom of thought, access to information, freedom of the press, and so on. Thank you. Um, Carol, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, you need to unmute, thanks. Sorry, um, I don't think I'll add anything to that, but I did notice just another question. Um, and if I think I understood it correctly, someone asked, is there some mechanism by which the local Hong Kong courts could limit the scope of the national security institutions that have been created? And um, in the article I published in the Hong Kong Law Journal, that's one of the things that I raised that I'm particularly concerned about is that it appears that they are not subject to the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong courts um, in that they're supposed to follow Hong Kong laws, but if they are acting in the course of their duties, Hong Kong law enforcement can't even stop their vehicles or inspect their vehicles and the implementing rules for the new police powers are not subject to judicial review. So it seems to me that there has been a concerted effort in the drafting of this law to make it very difficult for anyone to judicially review the way the security institutions are operating or how the police are exercising their new very extensive uh, powers of investigation and surveillance. And that is what worries me the most. So. Yes, if you are prosecuted and your case eventually goes to the courts, the courts might be able to give you some relief at that stage. 
but the invasion of your privacy and the invasion of your rights by these security institutions is, I think, going to be very difficult to prevent. Hmm. Thank you, Carol. Um, the last question then that I'll pose in this session before we move on to the, the next one um, is from Wilson Leung. And I, I want to pose it to you, Victor, because I think it's a direct uh, kind of challenge to, to one of the practicality points around your proposal. And the question is, Realistically, what would motivate Beijing to now allow for the enactment of a milder Article 23 form legislation, given that it has a much more powerful and broad ranging national security law in place? I think, of course, this is bringing uh, to us, let's say, the, the, real, the political reality of the relationship between LegCo um, and, and Beijing. I wonder, uh, you know, you, like I, are an outsider to this, so we, as you earlier said, sometimes can, can make proposals from, from left wing, perhaps. But how would you deal with, with that uh, concern? So um, I have to confess that uh, I, I, I don't read uh, Mandarin. I have not read the, the law. I, I know it's available in, in English as well, so I've, I've read it in uh, translation. Um, and so please, those who know better, correct me if, if I'm wrong. But I understand that, that uh, one of the articles of law, possibly Article 7, actually says that Hong Kong should uh, enact Article 23 legislation. So, so in fact, it's not a question of whether Beijing would allow it. it Beijing's actually reiterating the basic law um, requirement that the national uh, that that the legislation be enacted. Now, I'm not sure if I'm understanding that correctly. But um, my understanding is that it doesn't preclude Hong Kong enacting Article 23 legislation. Um, that said, even, even if I, I, I'm wrong on that, I, I think the, there's still the, the possibility of um, model Article 23 legislation being uh, used as a, a means of uh, both of evaluating uh, the implementation of uh, the, the Chinese law and also uh, infusing Hong Kong's own legal values into national security uh, decisions and institutions. That's great, Victor. Thank you. And I'm going to go to Cora, who wants to just supplement that very briefly uh, before we draw the session to an end. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Uh, Victor, you're absolutely right. The national security law actually envisages the Hong Kong government enacting Article 23 legislation. It states that there is still this obligation. So I think the question is whether, uh, the question posed by uh, Wilson is whether Beijing would allow room for enacting national security, so, sorry, enacting Article 23 legislation with overlapping content. Mm -hmm. with the national security law because as Danny has pointed out two crimes sedition um, and treason are not covered in the national security law so there's absolutely no problem with enacting article 23 legislation for those two offenses I think the question with especially when you pointed out that the one goal one one purpose of having a a, a, Nash, a good a, a, a a reasonably phrased article 23 legislation is to uh, open up space to get the law right. Um, if if that is one of the goals, then I think it's important to ask whether it would be possible to enact Article 23 legislation on the crimes that have already been covered by the national security law um, as well. And, and on that, I'm 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 not sure if there is such a space because uh, I I just simply don't know because questions arise as to how the two laws are then going to interact. Mm -hmm. The, the Beijing national security law mm -hmm. and the local um, Article 23 law. But but thank you very much. I I I, I love, love 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 that idea. And I remember that mm -hmm. when um, when when the the idea of a national China China um, released the news that they were going to enact a national security law for Hong Kong, the first thing that came to my mind was, and we had no details of the law back then. The first thing that came to my mind was. Um, Carol, um, the mm -hmm. idea of a model law, like Fiona and, and you were talking about the idea of a model law, how I wish we had the model law back then so we could immediately release those proposals. But, but of course, I know that in the end, it probably won't change anything because mm -hmm. everything has 
been said already, but, but thank you, Victor. Could, could I just respond very quickly or th throw in a, a, a point, Fiona? Please. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me that in, in co a context of, of legal pluralism, and uh, I, I'm thinking of the, the systems I know, that there's there are always going to be questions of jurisdictional overlap. And in fact, that to me is the beauty of legal pluralism. It's the strategic and creative ambiguity that it creates and the room that it creates for um, invention, innovation, creativity, dialogue. So I, I don't think that it's a problem if there is some overlap and some creative, constructive ambiguity and perhaps even tension. I think that leaves room for actors within the system to to negotiate, to 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 try to to reconcile the competing demands of two overlapping legal uh, systems. I think that's a beautiful um, segue. Sorry, Carol, I do see your hand, but we're so out of time. I'm so sorry. A beautiful segue into the next session because, of course, what in many ways enables creativity, progression, liberalism, and the rule of law within those spaces of ambiguity and tension is, uh, you know, the resilience of the legal system within which they are operating, uh, the approach to lawyering, the approach of the courts, and so on. And I think that that will uh, be addressed to a great extent in the next session. I apologize to those who posed questions that we didn't get to in this session. Some of them may be picked up in the next I invite you to take a very short three or four minute comfort break uh, during which cameras, uh, the session will remain live and then we'll return for the second panel. So thank you so much to our panelists, Carol Peterson, Paolo Cardinal, and Victor Ramraj, uh, joining us at variously different points of the night and the morning um, and afternoon. Uh, my thanks to all of you and we'll return in about three or four minutes time. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Carol um, and, and Victor um, and, and Paolo. Thanks very much for the presentation. Hey, uh, Carol, thanks so much um, for that. You're welcome. I'll, I'll, so, try, I'll try to uh, stay up. I'll see how I do. It's very thank late you. for you. And, and for Victor as well, it's very late. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll stay as long as I can. I want to. You're most welcome. Thanks for your very, very thoughtful and and generous and 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 you 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 propose something that is um, I think definitely worth considering. Um, so well, we, it, it, well, we we don't have enough time to discuss it in detail. But sure. it no, that's fine. That's fine. Well, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that it came up uh, in in earlier discussions. And Carol, I, that's wonderful that you, that you had uh, suggested it. Back, way back when. Uh, I, I think it's still yeah, a great it idea. Be, it but. was before all the turmoil and I, I mm. don't know if after the protests, um, if it would have been even possible. But, um, but the one point I was going to make and then we ran out of time is that Article 62 of the new law does say that this law will prevail where provisions of local laws of the Hong Kong SAR are inconsistent with this law. So it's already set up sort of a hierarchy. Um, it doesn't affect, I don't think, the Hong Kong basic law because that's actually a national law. But if, say, if by some miracle there was unity in the legislature in Hong Kong, which we don't have, but if they enacted a law that, say, defined secession more narrowly um, than this law does, then there's risk that China would say, forget it mm. because you're being mm. inconsistent. So I think it would have to be something that would be negotiated in advance, mm -hmm. sort of, um, as mm. some people suggested, with the idea of maybe providing more clarity. I don't know. Right. Johannes, mm. I saw you just came in. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I just want to say hi to, to Victor and, and, and Carol. I didn't have a chance to say hi to you. Just um, now. Nice to see you, Johannes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big sentence, uh, and I, I enjoy every part of it. Um, and, and I take Victor's point that um, the model law may still be useful for mm -hmm. things not covered by the NSL at the moment. Uh, but my concern, as shared by many other people, is whether this is the right atmosphere 
uh, is to discuss a modern law, you really need a rational legislature and a rational government, uh, which at the moment is uh, uh, absent. Uh, the government is not really uh, uh, working on any rational basis and the legislature is dysfunction. So to push a national law at this moment, it would end up with probably something even more restrictive and add more restrictions. Mm. Right. Um, that's, that's, that's what my everybody word. said at, at the conference when I first suggested it with a few other people. The problem is that j the situation just gets worse, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. every year it seems that the atmosphere gets worse. So it's, it's, it's yeah. sad. It's sad. But, yeah. you know, but um, pressure on the court is very strong. Mm -hmm. There's a concerted uh, effort to attack the judiciary as well. Absolutely. Yeah. M might, might I su suggest that uh, one of the ways in, in which it could be done, if, if it's not directly intended to become legislation, but to be sort of a, a genuine model law, it could be driven by academe. And, uh, and the, the, the academic team could invite representative members from different constituencies across Hong Kong society and, and even from uh, the mainland to um, to discuss it, to to give input, to and try to to uh, address concerns within the the model law. So I, I think it, it depends how it's done, depends on where it's done. But but I think um, I, I take your point, and of course you know better than I do uh, the the atmosphere in, in Hong Kong. But but I, I I would think that depending on how that process is understood of drafting a model law. I'm not sure what the American Law Institute does in its model you know, penal code, criminal code, um, but uh, it, it could be done through constituents, representatives of different constituencies uh, bringing their views forward. Yeah, and there is some history of that in Hong Kong. I mean, way back in, in the early 90s when Anna Wu wanted to introduce both her Equal Opportunities Bill, which she was able to introduce, but she also wanted to introduce a, a Human Rights Commission, Equal Opportunities and Human Rights Commission Bill. And the colonial governor would not let her do it because, and, he, and she couldn't introduce that bill without his permission because it would be a charge on the revenue. And so she actually just distributed it to the public and it was actually appended to an appendix to a book that was published by the Faculty of Law. And so it got people at least thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, so there are mm -hmm. possibilities. Um, it, it, it's almost in the spirit of track tube diplomacy. Yeah. Right, or track 2.5 diplomacy. Yeah. Track two legislature. Yeah. It, it might be interesting. One of the uh, one of the people attending has just said in the Q and A thing, if you had mass discussion of amending the law, a gov the government could claim that was subversive uh, under the existing national security law. Mm, I well, so I, I I don't uh, I don't think I have the expertise to comment on that, uh, but I, I think given that th there is a mandate in the national security law to enact legislation, this, I, I think, would be considered a constructive way of trying to achieve that goal. So uh, I, I think in, in its best light, um, I, I think it, it could be viewed as something positive by all concerned parties. Okay. Um, hi. So um, do you think we should start the second session? Uh, is Professor Lin and uh, Professor Simon Young and Dr. P.Y. Lo, um, are, you, are we ready for the second session? Yes. Okay, and, and Simon? Simon, okay, cool. Wow, that's a really nice background there. Um, okay, uh, welcome back um, to, 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 to this book launch. Um, in the second session, we are uh, very honored to have three speakers um, to reflect on their chapters um, for us. Professor Lin Fang from the City University of Hong Kong, Professor Simon Yang from the University of Hong Kong, and Dr. P. Y. Lo, a barrister at law. Uh, without further ado, shall we invite Professor Lin to start? Professor Lin, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Cora. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank Cora and Fiona for organizing this event and also giving me the opportunity to share my uh, views with you. Uh, the main point I made uh, in the chapter I contributed to the book is actually to uh, comment on the previous four book chapters and then essentially 
to make the argument that uh, Hong Kong should take the opportunity to enact the Article 23 <clears throat> legislation as soon as possible. And, uh, but now, I think that was uh, to Hong Kong's benefit. But now the uh, national security law for Hong Kong has been enacted and also implemented. So that basically has made my recommendation uh, more or less redundant. Okay. So what I will do in about seven, eight minutes is to make a few points. And the first point I want to make here is regarding a previous point made by another uh, panelist about the constitutionality of the NSL. I think here we need to take, uh, if you are familiar with the arguments from the mainland China, uh, I think we need to take their uh, proposition very seriously. And one proposition which has been made repeatedly uh, by mainland uh, government officials and also scholars is that the Chinese constitution and the basic law of Hong Kong uh, together constitute the constitutional basis for Hong Kong SAR. And the enactment of the national security law and uh, several other decisions made by either the NPC or the NPCSC for Hong Kong demonstrate that they take that a proposition very seriously. Whereas we in Hong Kong, we still primarily look at the basic law. We don't want to look at the Chinese constitution law at all. So that's a sharp contrast between the scholars uh, in Hong Kong overseas and those on the mainland China. I'm not arguing that that approach is the best approach or the proper approach uh, to uh, adopt that is the approach taken by them. And if we don't like that approach, and then we need to come up with uh, an alternative approach rather than just look at the basic law alone. One possibility is maybe the basic law needs to be amended. So then it will be the sole constitutional basis uh, for any decisions relating to uh, Hong Kong. And the second point I want to make is the new national security law for Hong Kong has actually uh, made fundamental change to the structure of national security systems under the principle of one country, two system. Uh, in that previously, if you look at the national security uh, regime or structure in mainland China or in China uh, under one country, two systems, you can say there, are, there is a sort of due system one in mainland China and the other for Hong Kong and Macau uh, through their own legislation on the Article 23. But now Hong Kong has, Hong Kong's national security system has become the third uh, model, you can say, within uh, one China, in that now Hong Kong can no longer have its separate, complete separate national security system. And Hong Kong's national security system has been partially integrated with the mainland Chinese in two aspects. One is the legislation itself, and the second is the law enforcement uh, organizations. So that's a, a very fundamental differ, uh, difference or change made by the national security law. So with the implementation of the national security law for Hong Kong, if you look at the consequence, actually, it's more desirable for the mainland China. Because before, if under Article 23 of the Basic Law, and uh, we've, if you look at uh, Professor Fu's article, and his, his argued, uh, one of the points he's made is, China actually wants to maintain certain control or some consistency uh, with regard to the approach towards national security between mainland China and Hong Kong. But on the Article 23 legislation, there's no mechanism for them to do that because the two national security systems in mainland China and in Hong Kong are separate, completely separate. So now with the enactment and the implementation of the national security law for Hong Kong, actually that 
barrier or that obstacle has been removed in the sense not only that they have enacted the law for Hong Kong, but also they have established the, the Office of National Security Law in Hong Kong. So the two systems now have been integrated. And now they actually have a mechanism to maintain certain consistency uh, with regard to national security between Hong Kong and the mainland China. For Hong Kong, of course, it has lost, uh, it's less desirable in the sense that it has lost legislative authority over those four crimes, but still maintain a bit control over other crimes. Okay. So that can be done. And with regard to the future, uh, I'm not as pessimistic as Carol, in the sense that the firewall has been damaged, which is true to a certain extent, it has been uh, damaged. But I'm still cautiously optimistic in the sense that now the enforcement of the national security for, for Hong Kong, the the first stage of the enforcement is still with Hong Kong, SAR. And also the first step of interpretation of the national security law is still with Hong Kong courts. So if we can deal with those two issues properly in Hong Kong, and if the situation in Hong Kong will not deteriorate as envisaged by the three circumstances under or covered by Article 55 of the National Security Law, then it's still possible, even though the law uh, is enacted by or has been enacted by the uh, mainland China and imp implemented in Hong Kong and uh, their Office for National Security is already here in Hong Kong. I think we can still maintain certain autonomy. Uh, in those areas. Okay. And with regard to the, uh, but of course that depends on the actual enforcement uh, by the Hong Kong SAR and how our courts will interpret uh, the law if cases are brought uh, before the courts. And so my conclusion is that though firewall has been semi uh, removed, but if the Hong Kong government can demonstrate a proper implementation of the law and and if we are going to enact the article 23 legislation in a way to supplement i wouldn't say to replace it's i don't think it's possible to replace to supplement or to provide more details to the national security law and the two systems and also the high degree of autonomy uh, in hong kong can still be uh, maintained so that's all, thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. Um, that is a, a very insightful um, and discerning presentation. You've pointed out some uh, very important constitutional law issues raised by the enactment of the national security law, including um, the question of whether the PRC constitution applies directly to Hong Kong. I think that really goes to the heart of the, the whole issue. It's a very, very important issue. And hopefully we'll be able to come back to discuss more uh, during the Q&A. Um, the other issue that you pointed out, which is very important, is the inter... Well, you've, you've very helpfully concept reconceptualized the relationship between the two national security systems. You, you think that there is now an integration, although your final point um, is that there is space for opening up the divide if if the law is properly implemented by courts. Um, although I think a, a very big question would be what is meant by proper implementation of the law? If judges um, are very, very faithful to their common law principles, actively apply the principle of legality, read down everything in the national security law, does that constitute proper implementation? So I think lots of interesting discussions. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. Uh, now let's move on to uh, Professor Simon Young. Um, uh, I'll hand over to you, Simon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We've been talking a lot about model laws, uh, but I like to hold up this project as a model project. Uh, it's a great uh, faculty plus project uh, with lots of 
faculty contribution, but the plus, of course, is with uh, other Hong Kong scholars uh, and also other international scholars. And in fact, today's event, I think, reflects uh, you know, those uh, virtues of this project. Uh, so uh, well done, uh, uh, team. Uh, uh, good work. Um, OK, in my short time, I want to just pick up on one point uh, that I made in my book chapter. And this concerns uh, the uh, possible offense of advocating independence in Hong Kong. And in my book chapter, uh, I thought that, you know, if we had future Article 23 legislation, it would look like they would move towards creating a new criminal offense of advocating independence. And I thought that was a bad idea. I thought it would be unconstitutional, not only violating freedom of expression, but also assembly, association, even going as far as freedom of thought, I think, because it was not just like uh, an offense uh, of, um, you know, destroying the flag or insulting the anthem. This would be much broader. Uh, I didn't think it would ever uh, hold up. And then I thought that well, maybe they might be uh, clever and just leave it to restrict it to public places. Um, and I thought that would also have problems as well, because it would have a, 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 a disproportionate impact and chilling effect on legitimate speech, particularly, for example, if you wanted to have an academic conference uh, to discuss issues of independence or self-determination, you might get someone uh, who comes to the event and has uh, such views, uh, and that could still be caught in, in, by the offense because it's a public place. Uh, so I thought that that shouldn't be done either because it would be unconstitutional. Now, when we turn to the national security law, it did not create an offense of advocating independence. It did create an offense of advocating terrorism, uh, but not uh, advocating independence. However, it did create an offense of inciting the new offense of secession. Uh, and uh, no definition was given to the word incite or inciting. Um, and uh, presumably the common law definition applies. Uh, so what is the difference between an offense of inciting secession, which we now have under the NSL, uh, and what I was referring to earlier as advocating independence? Is the former somehow less bad than the latter? Uh, did the executive strike a better balance between the legitimate aim of protecting national unity and the harmful impact on legitimate speech and discussion? Now, in this presentation, I want to make just two points in relation to those questions without necessarily answering those questions directly. Uh, the first point is that as a matter of technical law, as I understand it, an offense of uh, incitement is narrower than an offense of advocacy. Um, however, this is the second point, uh, as a matter of what we're seeing now in the enforcement of the law, uh, I think we are still in a situation where legitimate speech and discussion uh, is still compromised, particularly because of the wide police powers and particularly because of the lack of safeguards and assurances uh, that protect legitimate speech and discussion. All right, turning to the first point, why do I say incitement is narrower than advocacy? Well, let's look at the meaning of to advocate. And here I reference uh, the Oxford uh, English Dictionary. Uh, and uh, advocate means uh, under the proper limb, uh, the relevant limb, uh, to support, recommend, or speak in favor of something. Now, incitement is a narrower concept in two important ways. One, uh, is that with incitement, you have to have an audience. There needs to be an audience, at least of one person. Uh, otherwise, it, it could be attempt incitement, but, but uh, for the full offense of incitement, you need an audience of one person. Advocacy uh, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, need an audience, I don't, uh, based on that definition I just read out. You can advocate, and it's not so important that anyone actually hears uh, what you have to say. 
but for incitement, it is important because the common law definition of incitement it, it captures the idea that you're seeking to influence the mind of another to the commission of an offense. Right? You don't have to actually influence that person. The effect doesn't matter, but it has to reach the person uh, and it has to be reasonably capable of inciting that person. The second point, uh, and I don't think the first point is really a major difference simply because you know, I mean, no one usually advocates to themselves. They're usually advocating to others. So it's not a major point. But the second point I think is because advocacy can relate to general causes, right? But incitement must relate to specific acts, right? So you have to incite a person to commit certain acts, which if, if performed, would amount to an offense. So the, the mind has to be turned to specific acts, not just causes. Uh, and so for the uh, uh, offense of secession, this would have to relate to acts of organizing, planning, committing the separation of Hong Kong or another part of China from the PRC. I'm going to ignore the other two limbs. As all of you know, there are two other limbs that define secession. I think they're actually more difficult to prove. I'm just going to focus on the separation limb. So this is why I think that when people are in a shopping mall and they're holding up a placard uh, which has the slogan, five demands, no one less, uh, not one less, or, or even the other one of, you know, liberate Hong Kong revolution of our time. Uh, that does not amount to inciting uh, secession uh, because um, you're not encouraging any particular act of separation. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, and frankly speaking, you know, in that particular context, what are you encouraging? <laughs> really, at most, you're just encouraging other people to shout the slogan, right? And those do not amount to acts of secession. Um, so um, I think that's why you know, those types of acts do not actually violate the law. Um, and uh, in fact, I would even go further and say even purely academic discussions of the topic you know, should not fall afoul of the law um, because uh, you know, one is really debating uh, you know, the merits or demerits of you know, possible independence or self-determination. No one is uh, promoting any specific act of secession. Um, now, what if you set a, an essay question for your students? Hong Kong independence has many advantages, than, has more advantages than disadvantages. Discuss. Is that a problem? Again, I don't think so, because you're just simply looking at the merits and demerits of a particular position. It doesn't relate to a specific act of secession. Um, now, then I was scratching my head, well, can I, you know, short of, you know, having a militia and then carving off, you know, part of Hong Kong, uh, you know, uh, Lama Island, and then guarding it and, and preventing, you know, uh, the police from entering, etc. That, of course, would be an act of separation. Uh, but short of that, because as you know, the definition of secession doesn't require use of force. Um, what would amount to separation? I think and I'm willing to hear other views of this. I think perhaps organizing a referendum uh, probably would amount to an act of separation. Um, uh, so if you promote something like that, a, a referendum on separation, then that would be inciting uh, uh, the offense of secession. Uh, but uh, other things that I've talked about would not. All right, so that's just a very technical legal sort of analysis why I think inciting is, is, is narrower than advocating. I don't have time to talk about advocating terrorism today. Uh, that would involve other uh, important considerations. But what I want to talk about is the practical reality, uh, which is that uh, even though you know, all those things may not constitute crimes, the reality that we're seeing now is because of the wide police powers. Um, and that when someone does say something like uh, revolution of our times, or does say anything related to Hong Kong independence, it could well be evidence that shows the intention. I think here I refer to uh, Carol Peterson showing us that pur the purple flag, referring that this is evidence of, of an intent. And you can't deny that. Uh, and so, you know, if you uh, apply that kind of thinking, 
that then becomes the basis for applying these laws and also uh, the powers, the police powers, the power to take down information is extremely broad, not only evidence of a crime, but also uh, material that is likely to cause the occurrence of an offense endangering national security. That's extremely vague. And where, at what point in time is it likely to cause the occurrence? Um, so those police powers, I think, are perhaps quite um, a danger to, and, and, and they give rise to that chilling effect uh, that exists now. Now, one of the difficulties is that what we don't have right now are statements in the law that protect legitimate expression. Um, and that's not something that is uncommon. Um, we, in fact, have these statements in our existing law now in our uh, United Nations Anti-Terrorism Measures Ordinance, uh, there's uh, in the definition of a terrorist act, uh, there is um, reference to uh, an exception uh, that certain aspects of that definition does not apply if, uh, it's, if the action is done in the course of advocacy, protest, dissent, or industrial action. We see that in other anti-terrorism laws in other places. Also in our sedition law, there's a definition of you know, uh, innocent intentions when someone does not have uh, a seditious intent is if they're trying to point out mistakes, uh, if they're trying to improve uh, uh, the defects in the law. Uh, you know, these are all or persuade, you know, the government uh, to attempt to procure by lawful means the change of the law. Uh, you know, these are all legitimate purposes. Those are protections uh, in the law of sedition that we have. But none of that, unfortunately, we see in this national security law. And I would draw their other, other good examples from Canadian law as well. Uh, you know, they have an offense uh, of willful promotion of hatred, uh, but it doesn't apply. This offense doesn't apply if you talk in public, uh, sorry, private places. It's only about public uh, uh, conver uh, conversations or promotion. And there is a defense uh, which, uh, uh, what I describe as good faith defenses, this is section 319 of the Canadian Criminal Code. So for example, if you are uh, acting in good faith and you express or attempt to establish an argument, uh, an opinion on a religious subject or an opinion based on a belief in a religious text, uh, or if in good faith you try to point out that for the removal purpose of removal of matters producing or tending to produce feelings of hatred, uh, if you're acting in good faith uh, in these types of instances, so sort of like public interest defenses, uh, then you are protected. Unfortunately, we don't have any of that. And I think I'm going to conclude here by simply saying, you know, how can we sort of lower the chilling effect is hopefully as we get more case law from the courts, we get courts uh, uh, saying that although, you know, this is captured by the fence of secession, you know, a uh, legitimate discussion or academic debate uh, is fine. And I think those kinds of statements would be extremely helpful, would give us some assurances of uh, what is protected speech and what is not under this law, and uh, would help to remove some of the chilling effect. And also, I think, would help to rein in uh, some of the police powers and how it's being used uh, at present. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Simon. That is um, a, a very, very helpful um, presentation. The distinction between inciting and advocacy, I thought it was very clever. Um, uh, the the, the 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 constraints as you pointed out is that practically the police might have very wide powers and they might interpret the law uh, differently this harks back to uh, carol's point that a major way in which the national security law is now reaping its effect um, is through the chilling effects of wide police powers um, so that the law need that there need not be a lot of um, conviction uh, like a very high conviction rates in order to chill people. You, you could just have very wide police powers, vague um, terms in order to chill people. So um, thank you very much. The, the suggestions are, um, just going back to Victor's point earlier on, uh, we will still have to propose uh, what we think um, or ought to be the or ought to be the case, or how the law ought to be um, drafted, um, or what ought to be a, a proper interpretation of the law, um, just so that we could open up space for a proper uh, understanding or drafting of the law. And I think um, Simon's presentation is a very good example of um, excellent scholarship that that would be able to um, 
uh, do this despite the difficult uh, political uh, practical circumstances. Um, so thank you very much. Moving on now to uh, Dr. P.Y. Low. Um, P.Y., I'll hand over to you. Thank you, uh, Cora. Uh, may I just begin by uh, thanking uh, Cora and Fiona for organizing uh, the book launch, as well as uh, thanking them both once again for inviting me to write about judges and lawyers as, uh, as uh, sources of resilience uh, towards uh, well, China's uh, security imperatives over Hong Kong. Uh, when I was writing it in the 2018, uh, I was uh, thinking well, more um, well, optimistically or favorably of the situation uh, when the, actually the imperative uh, falls onto Hong Kong. Uh, but then the, when I was uh, revising it in 2019, uh, it's uh, less optimistic. And now uh, in the 2020, when I'm now commenting on the, the national security law and its effect on our judges and lawyers, uh, I think, well, the degree of optimism has, uh, has also uh, diminished. Now, um, I, as the last speaker, I probably has to sort of wrap up a few things uh, that have already been raised about uh, judges and lawyers uh, in Hong Kong in, as a consequence of the uh, imposition or on Hong Kong of uh, the national security law. So perhaps uh, I would do that uh, by, well, firstly highlighting, uh, by sharing the screen, some provisions of the, uh, of the national security law. Yes. Now uh, you, you can see here, um, we have been talking a lot about uh, so the protection of human rights and the uh, enshrining of certain principles of rule of law or criminal justice in Article 4 and Article 5. But uh, I wish to draw everyone's attention to Article 2 and Article 3. Article 2, uh, particularly, uh, um, amounts to probably an interpretation by the Standing Committee of National Abuse Congress as fundamental uh, provisions of basic law, the fact that uh, the uh, legal fact that uh, Hong Kong is an inalienable part of China, as well as uh, the SAL uh, being directly under the Central Peace government. This is added together, uh, added together to Article 2 is the requirement of non contravention by any institutional organization, uh, et cetera, in the region. And that probably uh, includes uh, uh, judges and lawyers. And that actually uh, is contingent. That requirement is contingent in Article 3 as the, uh, by highlighting as the constitutional duty of the SAR to safeguard national security and requiring the SAR of all its institutions, including the courts, to perform that duty. And this is made more explicitly in the third paragraph by telling the courts themselves, right, the prosecutors as well, that they should uh, effectively prevent, suppress, and impose penalties, et cetera, right, or acts or activity endangering national security. So it actually uh, uh, comes a question to me that whether our judges have that uh, freedom or are they really hamstrung uh, by these provisions in the in the application of course before application the interpretation of the uh, national security law provisions that apply to Hong Kong. So um, to that extent, uh, well, I'm uh, echoing parts of what Professor Lin Feng has said, but I'm pointing to not merely not the broader picture, but the narrow, but the but the more immediate and uh, and uh, an immediate picture for our judges uh, and lawyers, whether in their performance of their judicial, du in judicial duties and legal duties, when they are asked to uh, act in accordance with the law, have they got much cho many choices um, to uh, 
apply the law or are they give very, really, really being given instructions under the national security law um, to uh, apply it in a particular way? And that will uh, actually uh, kill or actually become a weight on the balancing uh, between the legitimate interest of uh, protecting national security and uh, safeguarding uh, the enjoyment of uh, fundamental rights that uh, judges will have to perform under um, the national security law, a national law apply applicable to Hong Kong uh, under the basic law. So um, this, this is one point that probably I need to address. Uh, the other point I would I, I probably need to address in wrapping up uh, is about uh, the foreign judges um, working in Hong Kong, known permanent judges of our Court of Final Appeal. I think mean, one uh, attendee has already pointed out that uh, one member of uh, the uh, originally 14 uh, has resigned uh, early September. But then the, a few have already expressed the view that they will not resign. One is not going to travel because of old age, uh, but then uh, a few of them have, already, have uh, indicated that they are not uh, resigning. They are supporting the uh, Chief Justice and his uh, uh, permanent judges uh, and the permanent judges of the Court of Final Appeal, the whole judiciary as well. So are there going to be mass resignation? I don't think in the, I don't think in the short term or maybe in the medium term, at least uh, to 2021. Um, but then uh, will there be uh, difficulties in the recruiting uh, non-permanent non judges uh, in the near future? Um, there may be difficulty because uh, nowadays, after the enactment of the uh, NXL uh, and it's coming into operation, uh, in June, uh, we immediately see questioning uh, by uh, parliamentary parliamentarians uh, around the uh, major common law jurisdictions on whether judges uh, from, their juris from their jurisdictions should actually come to Hong Kong to adjudicate cases as non-permanent judges of the CFA when they are going to, well, uh, when they are going to uh, take the judicial oath to, uh, to uh, uphold the basic law and uh, to administer the laws of Hong Kong, which now includes the national security law, as well as uh, 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 pledge allegiance to the Hong Kong Special Ministry region of the People's Republic of China. So um, that may create a problem in uh, future recruitment uh, from the major common law jurisdictions. And uh, we all know and we all appreciate uh, their contributions uh, over the last uh, 23 years of these non-permanent judges to Hong Kong's jurisprudence. They really uh, come to the, 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 uh, serve as the litmus test for, our, for Hong Kong's uh, common law system uh, to be uh, on the par, uh, well-respected among the common law jurisdictions. And this brings uh, to, Hong, to Hong Kong the reputation as a uh, respected uh, common law jurisdiction. Uh, future adjudications concerning a protection of fundamental human rights will be a significant uh, test for uh, our uh, courts in Hong Kong. But they are under uh, pressure locally uh, now because of, uh, well, um, see that what seems to be campaigns complaining judges uh, and magistrates of their decisions, uh, granting bails uh, or not granting bail, their verdicts uh, and sentences. Uh, they're so numerous that the judiciary has this, uh, cannot address the uh, complaints against uh, a magistrate or made by many, many people 
uh, individually by individual companies, but uh, they have the judiciary now as a website, right? have a page and the website uh, listing out, well, six cases uh, at the moment uh, that attracted, that has attracted many, many uh, complaints about bias, about uh, pre pre preconceived ideas. And uh, of course, la last week, uh, the Chief Justice uh, has to uh, issue a 18-page English uh, language uh, statement to uh, highlight uh, the basics of criminal justice in Hong Kong, as well as how uh, the judges and the magistrates uh, consistently acting consistently with their judicial of minister uh, cases, minister justice in Hong Kong, and uh, that uh, ungrounded criticisms uh, should not be. Um, uh, well, we grant it. Now, the, and this is the environment that our judges um, are facing at the moment. Um, I, I, this is going to be a continuing uh, difficulty uh, for our Hong Kong's judiciary to go about uh, doing its work. Um, acting faithfully to uh, judicial oath and also trying their best to explain uh, to the public on what uh, they have been uh, what they are doing uh, in cases according to the law um, uh, I quoted at the, uh, in my chapter uh, the farewell speech of uh, mr. Justice Tang uh, a permanent judge uh, of the uh, Court of Final Appeal when he retired in 2018. He said that uh, uh, the faith in the judiciary once lost cannot be completely regained. This is uh, very um, much a uh, caution that uh, we need to uh, bear in mind these days uh, when we are uh, scrutinizing as we need to, every judicial decision. Uh, if uh, faith of the public in the judiciary and, well, the officers of the court, uh, barristers and solicitors are lost, then, uh, well, we lost a source of resilience. And uh, then what we have left um, in, the, in, the, in the public's mind may be simply uh, that we are coming uh, in where we have to deal with uh, the dual state, the state of the law, which is diminishing, and the uh, state of the prerogative uh, that is centered on our chief executive in, in the SAR, who has been given a lot of powers that are presumably unre uh, unreviewable or intended to be unreviewable under the NSL. Um, I think I'll stop here, and uh, I would uh, I would be very well. I welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Py. Um, as one of the members of the audience stated in the Q and A, it seems that everybody in this webinar has high expectations on the judges, and I think um, you've reminded us of the difficult environment in which they operate um, and also the difficulties of recruiting judges, uh, both local and, and foreign judges. Um, so on that note, um, I would now like to open the session to um, the panelists. Uh, would anyone like to ask questions or give comments in the panel? Well, if not, then um, maybe I'll start by, uh, sorry, Johannes. Uh, I, I think since no one is speaking, I, I might just throw one or two questions out then. Um, and what, one point I just want to follow up with Simon, I think I agree with Simon's uh, on the why police power. Uh, and one of the concerns is not just the police to arrest, but it seems these days police are quite prepared to charge people uh, on the basis of very flimsy evidence. Uh, and the worrying part now, it seems at least in some cases, um, the court is going to deny bail 
uh, for these people. And that's good enough because by denying bail, you are now putting a person in custody for at least eight or 12 months before trial. Uh, and the, the concern is really the reason for denying bail. Because it appears that the reason is because the defendant is likely to repeat the offense and they are likely to repeat the offense because they are, these are political, ideological offense. Uh, and so it is almost self-serving. By charging them with a political crime, you're alleging that they are committing a political activities and by political commit, uh, activities, you are now suggesting they are likely to repeat and therefore bail is denied. And whatever be the outcome of the trial, the purpose is served already uh, and that seems to be a, a worrying trend. Uh, and so far, it seems uh, some of the more high profile cases, uh, in none of these cases, bail has been granted. Um, so I'd I like to see what Simon's thought on that. The, the other point, um, I, I think PY is right to paint a, a, a very gloomy picture for the judiciary. Uh, and indeed, in comparative um, studies, uh, the breakdown of the judicial independence is probably the best sign of the breakdown of the rule of law. And in most jurisdictions, uh, the judiciary uh, is the one that is under major attack when you have uh, uh, the onset of an authoritarian government. And one sad thing about the, the, the speech by the Chief Justice is uh, the speech should be made by the Secretary for Justice, not by the Chief Justice. Uh, and the whole point or the role of the Secretary of Justice is to defend the judiciary when the judiciary has come under attack. And we see nothing from the Secretary for Justice and the Chief Justice has to engage in the political debate. And of course, immediately he was attacked by various groups and you, you put the judiciary into the center of controversy. Uh, and it seems that this is a, that it's a concerted effort to weaken the power of the judiciary uh, from the days when they require judges to be patriotic, to be supportive of the other branches, to the recent discussions on separation of power. It seems to me the whole discussion of separation of power is aimed at uh, uh, um, um, diminishing uh, independence of the judiciary. The judiciary is the real target of that discussions. Uh, and I think one of, uh, and in the NSL, you can see that great sense of distrust or suspicions of the judiciary. Uh, and one interesting thing I would like to see is when it comes to the designated judge, uh, and so far the court, the, the, C, the chief executive has not appointed many judges, mostly uh, at the magistrate level. But as some of these cases works through the system, when you go to the Court of Appeal and eventually to the Court of Final Appeal, who can be the designated judge uh, in the Court of Final Appeal? And would the foreign judge be designated as one of the designated judge? Uh, I think that would be the limits test uh, of how NSR is going to operate. Thank you very much, Johannes. Um, any response from our panelists or any further questions? Yeah, Simon? Let me just respond uh, on the question of bail. Um, yes, it is of some concern. Now we have to distinguish between bail for NSL cases and bail for other cases. Now we have a judgment from the CFI on the, the bail provision in the NSL. There's one short, uh, small provision that deals with bail. The CFI judgment of the two, two judges tries to give us some assurance uh, that this doesn't really change the existing law very much. I think they do not a bad job in doing that. Uh, they tell us that we shouldn't think of it as necessarily putting a burden on the defendant to try to prove their uh, need, their case for uh, release. And they also say that in most cases, they really won't make it much of a difference. Uh, so I think I hope the lower court, the magistrates will take that to heart when they are dealing with an NSL case. Um, now, but I think, uh, Joanna, your other point is that uh, are, we, are the magistrates and judges somehow treating these political cases somewhat differently, that somehow because uh, they are political, it shows an inclination to recommit uh, these offenses. I haven't quite seen that yet. And uh, we haven't had a good case yet that go to the high court. Even that judicial review case was not a bail, a, a bail review case. Uh, and I think I would assume that if someone was trying to say that they're otherwise, you know, they have a clean record, they have uh, no, not previously involved, and the, and the government is simply arguing, well, he's, it's because of his political views that we think he's going to commit other offenses. I think that would be a good case for bringing a bail review. Uh, and we haven't quite uh, has seen a judgment like that. So although we may suspect this, uh, we haven't seen it uh, identified in the case law. 
Um, yes, can I, can I uh, just add to one point that Johannes made uh, in relation to the designated, designated judges under Article 42 of the uh, NXL? Um, I mean, we should uh, pay a lot of attention to uh, the trial judges that will be uh, designated to hear um, NXL uh, or, uh, offenses, trials, uh, magistrates or uh, district court judges or uh, court of first instance judges. Uh, so far, um, we haven't got any hint on who are going to be uh, involved in these uh, cases. Um, so um, that's a, that is also a litmus test uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, PYs and Simon and Johannes. Uh, I would now um, uh, direct some questions to the panelists. Uh, so I've been looking at the questions and I won't be able to um, read out those questions in, um, in, in the wording that they were posed, but I think they are related to three, the three types of questions. The first concerns, there are a lot of concerns about judicial independence. Um, juxtaposed with the very high expectations that all of us have on judges. Um, so in this group of questions, uh, people ask, what, what, how should courts treat the national security law and, and how should they handle national security cases? How activist or how, how defined should they, ready, uh, should, should, should they be? Um, this is related to the point made earlier on by Professor Lin about courts properly implementing law, what is meant by proper implementation. And uh, of course, this also raises the issue of the hierarchy between the basic law and the national security law, again raised by Professor Lin earlier on. Should courts be um, willing to strike down national security law provisions that violate the basic law? Uh, the second question within this category of question has to do with how are we supposed to increase are there ways of increasing or enhancing judicial independence? Given that this is the state of affairs, courts would have to deal with these cases. Are there ways of enhancing judicial independence? The second category of questions um, concerns not just the law or legal responses or judicial responses, but more generally, how should civil society um, and other institutions in Hong Kong react to Chinese advances in national security. And um, this harks back to uh, Paulo's uh, presentation and chapter. We see that Macau and Hong Kong, in the past at least, or, or arguably the present, they are uh, on two different paths, as in, 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 in Macau, civil society is much weaker, and hence we see that the uh, security advances or impositions from China have correspondingly also been much weaker and have people have been saying that well perhaps Hong Kong should avoid being so antagonistic so that we wouldn't attract such radical responses from China like it's a chain of action and reaction um, so it how would you evaluate statements like that should we go down Macau's path. Um, I was also very surprised to hear from Paolo that um, the, 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 there are now suggestions in Macau about um, revising certain criminal procedures in, in light of what, what has happened in, in Hong Kong as well. So that's a second category question. And the, the final um, category, this is not raised in the Q&A, but it's a, it's a very interesting issue that came out from um, Professor Lin's presentation about the idea of amending the basic law so that it would become the sole basis of Hong Kong's constitutional law. So basically China now views that the basic law is not an adequate basis of Hong Kong constitutional law and, and so they directly apply the PRC constitution. Uh, is the idea of amending the basic law so that theoretically at least we could see it as being the sole basis uh, anything but is it, is it worth pursuing at all? So I'll, I'll leave um, the remaining five minutes or so to our panelists. Um, does, it, does anyone like to, in, in the panel, like to re reply to the questions? Sorry, hi, uh, Professor Lin, I think you have to unmute. 
Okay, sorry. I just say a few words about the uh, what I said about the proper implementation of the uh, national security law, and uh, because I didn't uh, define it, I think in Hong Kong, as far as the judiciary is concerned, because the CFA has made it clearly that Hong Kong courts will take a common law approach in implementing the laws, including those national laws in Hong Kong. So that approach uh, has been decided by the uh, CFA. I think we should follow that. And also uh, with regard to the protection of fundamental rights, given the uh, Article 39 of the basic law and also the status of the basic law. And uh, I think the courts uh, have the duty to provide uh, proper protection of human rights uh, or implementation of the uh, ICCPR in Hong Kong as applied through Article 39. Okay. I, mean, I, I, I will add one thing, um, which uh, actually is a position that seems to draw, that one can draw from the, uh, from, from the Tong case, uh, the first NSL case that uh, was heard by the Court of First Instance, which suggests that the uh, courts are willing uh, to uh, it, it, they interpret the uh, NSL uh, consistently and harmoniously as far as possible with the uh, uh, guaranteed rights under the basic law. So this is the sort of soft approach uh, as against, well, uh, what may be said, the hard approach of uh, arguing that uh, certain provisions of the uh, NSL uh, is uh, unconstitutional or uh, violating, violative of uh, fundamental rights and therefore have no effect. Yep, Johannes. Um. Um, just make a quick point on enhancement of judicial independence. Uh, I remember earlier on, uh, Mr. Justice uh, Litton, a former CFA judge, uh, launched an attack on the judiciary for giving long-winded judgments and being lured by lawyers into all kinds of fancy legal arguments in judicial review and therefore losing focus of the case. Uh, uh, of course, in, in, in one sense, the judges should focus on the case. Uh, but on the other hand, I disagree with him because uh, his view has been uh, quite widely quoted in the, those who attack the judiciary. I think it is a fundamental right that uh, any litigant should know the reason why his argument is accepted and not accepted by the court. Uh, and it must be the duty of the court to explain the basis of their decisions. Uh, and I think that is one part which the judiciary, uh, which is important for the judiciary to maintain its, uh, its independence, uh, is to focus uh, on the rationality of the judiciary. I think the legitimacy of the judiciary lies in the rational process, uh, in their independence. And in times of attack, it is even more important uh, for the court to engage in this kind of arguments uh, and to explain clearly the basis of their uh, decisions. Uh, and at the same time, I think it would be useful, um, as, as I think Lin uh, Fung made a, a good point earlier on, is uh, too often to be defend the common law system without engaging uh, the PRC system. Uh, and I, I think for academic, at least, uh, uh, even if we disagree with them, uh, it is worthwhile to engage and see the, the argument of their size. At least we know if we are going to reject that, we know the reason why. Uh, whereas at the moment, we might be too one-sided. And that might add to what Victor said earlier about uh, to enrich the legal diversity in a way. Thank you, Johannes. Any final comments before we close it, Paolo? Yes, hello. It's um, uh, good that you mentioned the, the comparison between Macau and Hong Kong. And um, my point is not that if uh, Hong Kong behaves better, the results will be better. My point is different uh, in the sense that even though there are two paths, the systemic approach from Beijing to Hong Kong and Macau are basically the same, control. The big difference is the methodology and the reception. 
Whereas in Hong Kong, you have uh, resistance, resilience, uh, you have uh, civic uh, culture, demonstrations, etc., etc. In Hong, in Macau, you do not have. In Macau, everything is much more docile, much more prone to what comes from the center. So without making a big fuss, a big, uh, big problem, things that are wanted are implemented in the sense that no matter you are a good student or a bad student, and this image many times comes, by the end of the day, basically the results are the same. The, the noise, the attention, it would be different. Macau is very small, it's not in international press, etc., etc. but the result is the same. And I will conclude by giving a very specific example. One I mentioned in my presentation, the president of the Court of Final Appeal of Macau promoted the role of his court as a guardian of stability. They are there to defend stability of Macau and of the region of Hong Kong and China, not to apply the law, not to render justice. You compare this to the, the <clears throat> Geoffrey Ma's um, paper uh, communication that he made last, last week, where he defended the courts, the role of the courts, application of the law, etc., etc. So you can see in these very uh, small examples the difference. Here, whatever it is supposed to happen will, in a docile and energetic way, happen. Whereas in Hong Kong, it is usually met with resistance. But by the end of the day, the policy is the same. The results, more painful or less painful, will be the same. That's my, the way I look at things like this. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Um, so uh, please join me in thanking all the panelists. Um, uh, thank you very much for your um, uh, uh, highly fascinating presentations uh, and, and comments and questions, um, which um, give us lots of food for thought. Um, we, we, we don't have enough time to continue with all the exciting discussions, but hopefully we'll be able to continue these discussions on another occasion. Um, thank you to all participants for tuning in um, from the various time zones and despite the difficult circumstances. Um, and um, thank you very, very much once again. Uh, if you're interested in uh, purchasing the book, um, there are details in the email that was sent to you. Um, uh, and, and please let us know if you have difficulty accessing the, uh, the discount um, coupon. Um, thank you very much once again. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>